Do we feel it? I see some young children in the back. Will you just stand up for one second so we can all wave to you? The kids, come on, get up. Woo! So my life has been a search about value and values. And a couple of years ago, I left the world of value creation and decided at a defining moment in my life to ask, what do I value? And I left the world of commerce and decided to become a full-time advocate for the arts, for artists and designers, because I'd met too many that were struggling. And it literally and figuratively broke my heart, whether it was in this country, in basements in Brooklyn, or in Mumbai or Shanghai. I saw so many artists who had to give to our world in myriad ways, whether it was in the fine arts, for-profit, non-profit, or government sectors. And then as Tom said, I met Tom Scott. And I normally will not accept speaking invitations. And he told me that the mission behind this project that he and Kate have created is to seek the truth. And if you meet Tom, you know right away that you're dealing with someone who speaks with right speech. So my truth today is a big one. And I believe that every age has a vision and big ideas. And the big idea that I think that we are at the cusp of, which this project is a resounding testament to, is the rebirth and renaissance of art and commerce together for the benefit of all humankind. And I'd like to discuss two specific movements that I have been intricately involved with over the last several years. One is known as STEM to STEAM, and one is cultural entrepreneurship. My name is Michael Spalter, and I'm deeply humbled to be with all of you today, especially my daughter, Amelia. Um, if you would, I'd like to play a short audio clip. But before I do, this inspired me in terms of values. And it was a defining moment for me to hear this speech. And I would note that with us today in our audience, we have US poet emeritus Billy Collins and an incredible professor, Lisa New, who have brought poetry to many. And this is a talk that John Fitzgerald Kennedy gave at Amherst College, and it was homage to Frost and the role of artists and designer in society. If we can just play it very briefly, thank you. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the art as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. Albert Einstein, like President Kennedy, understood the power of art. And as many of you know, he was very fond of doing thought experiments. So with your permission right now, I'd like to do a quick thought experiment. Imagine, if you will, you have two college-age children. They might be your son or daughter or someone that you've just cultivated and loved throughout life. The first child comes to you and announces that they've gotten into college and they're going to go study business let's say marketing. The other beloved child comes to you and says they've gotten into college and they're going to go study art and say calligraphy. Now, if you can, imagine the millions of parents or loved ones of children of college age who are not privileged or fortunate enough to be in this tent today. How might they respond to those two questions? On a personal note, my life partner, Ann Morgan Spalter, when she got into RISD, the daughter of a Harvard PhD who's an avid museum goer, went to her mom with great excitement and announced, I got in. And her mom said, you're not going. Her mother is a warrior. She loves her daughter. And she did not know what Anne might do after graduating from art school. Fortunately, Anne persevered. Her parents relented. And she's gone on to become an internationally acclaimed digital artist, having written a textbook that's used around the world on the computer and the visual arts, and started the digital art programs at Brown and RISD. But the question that Anne's mother asked is one that I am often posed with by many parents who are concerned about putting themselves into debt and or paying a quarter of a million dollars to send a kid to art school. And why are they worried? They're worried because art funding in this country is being cut to the bones. Artists and designers still often are freelancers and part-timers working without job security or benefits. There's little to no regulations that support or help our artists. In our earlier program, anyone who's involved with the SEC has books this big on regulations. 
the art world next to zero. You look at our United States cabinet and we have to ask ourselves, why is there not a secretary of arts and culture that we can look up to? This is not something that's new. And this next message, which went viral recently, was from a designer named Dan. Dan was asked to enter a free competition to provide his work, a logo, for the recent fight at the MGM Grand, the Floyd Money Mer Merriweather fight. I don't follow boxing, but I thought Dan's response was utterly fascinating. He wrote back to the fight's promoters, glad you're digging my style. It's with great sadness that I must decline your enticing offer to work for you for free. <laughs> I know that boxing matches in Vegas are extremely low budget affairs, especially ones with nobodies like Floyd Money Mayweather. I also understand that a mom and pop cable channel like Showtime must rely on handouts just to keep on the lights these days. My only hope is that you can scrape together a few bucks from this grassroots events at the MGM Grand to put yourself in the black. And if that happens, you might consider using some of that money to pay people for what they've been professionally trained to do, such as design. Godspeed, Dan. One, one person, please don't clap because I've got to be on time for Tom Scott or I'm going to be kicked out of here. Um, one person who understood this perhaps better than anyone, and one clip, and we've seen this clip, this particular small clip I wish to show illustrates to me and what I show parents who are considering sending their kids to an art school, the power of art and an art education. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Jobs. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me, and we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. Imagine what our world would be like if Steve Jobs had not popped into that art class, a calligraphy class. And imagine how fortunate the Nantucket Project is to have Richard Saul Worman as an advisor where the Mac was first introduced at his original TED conference. So what is the opportunity today in 2014 as we gather in this incredible setting? First, there's a vast and untapped reservoir of creative talent in the arts with millions of artists and designers eager to imagine, innovate, and create. Second, there's a critical and urgent need in business for creative and critical problem solving where reason does far often trump passion or innovation. Third, our educational systems are in urgent need of steroids to help our artists and designers. And we have hope, and it's on the way. And as Mr. Witherby said at the beginning of our section here, this is an unprecedented time of visual communications, it's the Nantucket Project that cited that there are over 50 billion videos being watched every single month, 600 billion videos a year. Every single minute, 24 hours a day, there's over 100 hours of content being uploaded onto YouTube. Who are these storytellers? And who is invoking design thinking, user interaction design, graphic design, imagination, creativity, and innovation to bring and power stories through this huge information 
cluster, artists and designers. And I would note that we're at the cusp of a new literacy, visual literacy, one that is being powered by artists and designers. The role of art and design has been elevated, but the general perception of the public lags behind. Allow me, if I may, with this next simple diagram to explain. To move culture forward in a positive manner, we need the overlap of arts education, arts and education, and that is fulfilled by schools, art schools like RISD. In the commerce and education overlap, that mission is being fulfilled by schools like the Harvard Business School. And the art and commerce overlap is the current art and design professionals increasingly innovating with enlightened members of commerce. When these three overlaps combined, we get cultural enterprise. Cultural enterprise is enterprise-based solutions that provide the organizational infrastructure necessary for the artist and arts to create, thrive, and maximize their societal impact. In the past 20 years, the US has become less entrepreneurial. Arts and cultural production has continued to decline, hovering at about 3.4%. I'm not an economist, so someone will have to fact check that. But I did get these figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I believe that one powerful way to reverse these trends is through the birth of cultural enterprise, which I'll be discussing in more detail. The key and critical element in the diagram is education. And as President Nelson Mandela stated, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. The Rhode Island School of Design was founded in 1877 by a group of visionary and courageous women decades before women would get the vote in this country. From its very beginning, Rizzi was teaching, training, technical training, and defining and developing skill sets in relationship to commerce. And it has evolved into one of the preeminent cutting edge art schools the world over. None of that original impulse was lost. The relationship between the fine and applied arts at RISD may well serve as a pedagogical model for the expansion of creative problem solving into entrepreneurship and commerce more broadly. The movement from the artisanal to industrial to fine arts at RISD is one of the great hidden success stories of this country, and it is a clarion model of the effective interconnectedness of creative problem solving in art, technology, and commerce through design thinking. But what do we mean by design thinking? It is learning the art of critical making with one's hands. It's learning the art of critical thinking with one's imagination. It's finding simplicity in complexity, finding beauty and yet functionality. Design thinking, when properly used, enables students to understand materials from pixels to paints metals to pigments and processes, both abstract, theoretical, and concrete. And executives are increasingly taking note of the power of design thinking, a power which produces elegant, innovative, and creative solutions to product services and enhances the customer experience. RISD's model is not a co-optation of art by business or business by art, but a recognition of the common ground of creative problem solving necessary to both and where is this insight developed and practiced? In our educational institutions and government bodies. And I'm very pleased that RISD is leading a national movement known as STEM to STEAM. And we've heard a lot about STEM. But as Yo-Yo Ma shares, STEM without STEAM loses power. But with STEAM, we can power our country forward. What is often missing from STEAM and will always be America's greatest strengths in our cultural, commercial, and educational institutions is innovation, imagination, and creativity. Make no mistake about that. Einstein, esteemed thinker, remarked, I live my life in music. I daydream in music. I see my life in terms of music and get the most joy out of music. Today, the Congressional Esteemed Caucus, started only in 2013, has over 74 congressional delegates, highlighting the importance of the role of artist and designer in our economy, our society, and as we sit here today, hopefully in the halls of Congress. And this is an important reaffirmation of the importance of art education, and I believe will further accelerate this new concept known as cultural entrepreneurship. So now, if I may introduce you to cultural entrepreneurship. Over 20 years ago at Harvard University, 
John Whitehead, a visionary, came up with this concept of social entrepreneurship. He served on many nonprofit boards, but his observations were that too many leaders of nonprofit organizations lacked the appropriate management, training, and tools. Today, fast forward, social enterprise is core to Harvard Business School's mission. Over 10% of its graduates last year entered the fields of social enterprise. And as patronage models in the arts become increasingly dated, it is critical to teach cultural leaders, management, education, and tools to also become more effective leaders and increase revenue streams and understand cost management and management skills. And today, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it, there are few, if any, schools preparing our cultural leaders to be effective. Cultural entrepreneurship is born out of an idea between Nita Noria, the 10th dean of the Harvard Business School, a magnificent, beautiful man who is my teacher, and my friend, Yo-Yo Ma. After they met, Neaton called me, and he wanted my input on this idea, and I was struck like thunder. In fact, I spilled my coffee all over my shirt. <laughs> and I then immediately called my dear friend Susan Dreyfus, an artist, Pulitzer Academy, and Emmy Award nominee, and we spent six months on our own writing an unsolicited working paper because we found this idea to be so profound and moving, a way to stem the decline in the number of students who are entering the arts and humanities, and a way to show young minds and adults that working in art can be mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and with the proper tools, financially meaningful and soulful. So what are some of the cultural entrepreneurial fields that could be benefited? Here's but a quick list. And now, if I may, show you a quick sneak peek of cultural entrepreneurship in action. It's in an embryonic form, as Neaton would share, but it holds great promise. Please run the video. Thank you. We're here for a week, where we're studying cultural entrepreneurship in New York City, uh, and we've got 36 students from, I think, seven or eight or nine schools. We're, uh, we're spending the week um, uh, visiting startups, visiting bigger companies, visiting foundations, fashion, food, fine arts. Welcome. So I'm not really on crutches, I'm getting the empathy of experiencing what someone on crutches might feel like while on the subway. I'll never forget meeting Diane von Furstenberg one-on-one -on -one in her office. Wow, what an impressive group. <laughs> It was an amazing week, wow. I got like a whole business, finance, kind of venture capitalist 101 education for myself. I just thought the accessibility of the time and the generosity that these people gave us made this trip a once in a lifetime experience. This new convergence and renaissance has already begun. One need to look, look any further than this chart, which is illustrating companies today that are recruiting at RISD and other art schools around the world. And I would note that Microsoft is a sponsor of this group, I believe, and is getting it. Um, only a few years ago, it would be totally unimaginable that some of these companies would be recruiting at an art school. Managing at the intersection of art and commerce means translating the language of art into commerce, and educators and executives are noting the creative readiness of the US workforce and it is so needed. The opportunity is for those in companies to figure out how to incorporate the artistic mind into their ecosystems. And how do we see design thinkers and steam thinkers implement in the world of virtual commerce, which I alluded to and Tom did and Mr. Witherby did later. There are some crazy product and business ideas in here that have never seen the light of day. Today, I wanna to tell you about one that's jumped from these pages into the real world, and the story is Airbnb. And it starts here, at the Rhode Island School of Design, where I was pursuing a double major in industrial and graphic design. This moleskin saw a lot of use. It got a workout. It's at RISD where we learned to solve problems creatively. It was also at RISD where I met this guy. This is Brian Chesky. I was living in this great apartment, right in downtown San Francisco. It was spacious, it had lots of light. <laughs> and um, there was a problem. 
is that the minute he moved up, our rent went up. And suddenly, we found ourselves unable to afford our own apartment. We had to think, and we had to think fast. It just so happens, that same weekend, a design conference was coming to San Francisco that was so big, all the hotels had sold out in the city. So, and we're starting to, to think, hmm, man, we've got some extra space here. <laughs> There's more over there. Oh, look at all this extra space. And we started to come up with this idea of what if we were able to blow up an air mattress, put it in our living room, and rent it out to designers who need a place to stay for the conference. We could go so far as to cook them breakfast. By the end of that night, we had this concept called air bed and breakfast. <laughs> Joe and Brian can pay the rent today. They have 800,000 listings in 34,000 cities in 190 countries around the world. Now, if I may ask you all, please close your eyes. Please close your eyes. Thank you. I want to tell you a quick story about an undergraduate at Harvard named Constantine. Constantine's best friend growing up was blind. He entered the Harvard University Dean's Cultural Entrepreneurship Initiative Challenge. He thought to himself, what if I could use 3D printing to somehow enable the visually impaired, of which there are 285 million in the world. Some of you may have family members, or some of you may well be visually impaired. And Constantine came up with a way through this, Midas Touch. Midas Touch may enable for the first time millions of visually impaired people to touch and experience the beauty of painting. This is but one of just hundreds of submissions for this project. A STEAM education when married to cultural entrepreneurship training is a powerful way to help people with significant value creation but with limited resources. And for me, on a personal note, this resonates no greater than in the developing world where millions of women and girls are at risk as never before. And this is but one example of a woman named Mrs. Ma who took in sex trafficking victims, some as young as age five who were brutally beaten and raped, and when they returned to their home, they were disowned by their own communities because they were considered to be impure. Mrs. Ma is but one of thousands of unsung heroes of compassion around the world in cultural fields who for persistence and term, term, determination alone are uplifting those. And now today, it is a cooperative with 110 women. They've gone from being the most destitute in the village to some of the wealthiest. And most importantly, have reclaimed their dignity. Mrs. Ma is one of my heroes as is Shaziz Shazid, Vanessa Carey, and Nancy Lublin, who will hear shortly, and Louis Schwartzberg, who are all with us today and in the coming days. And on a personal note, the most important person in our world is my daughter, Amelia, and we've decided to walk the walk, talk the talk, and we're homeschooling her. And we're combining a STEAM education with cultural entrepreneurship. Amelia has already written her own book, and in addition to traditional courses, is pursuing her love of stand-up comedy, having performed many times over the last year in New York City. And finally, we are directing funds between the Harvard Business School and RISD for a pilot. I don't know where the talks will go, but I am thrilled that they have begun. And now what can you do? First, call your congressional delegate, ask if they're part of the STEAM caucus. Two, if you're a titan of commerce in the room, call in your HR teams and ask what they are doing to integrate artists and designers into your ecosystem, not just into your art departments. Three, if you're one of the extraordinary artists in this room, corner some of the titans of commerce and begin a dialogue. That's what this project is all about. Four, if you're on a board of a cultural educational institution, ask the management teams and your fellow board and trustee members whether they have heard of STEAM and or cultural enterprise. And if they haven't, anyone is invited to come visit me at RISD and see it firsthand. Together, we can empower artists and designers to work with those in industry and government for the benefit of all humankind. Thank you very much.